Hi, everybody. My name is Rich Castle, and I direct Capolino's Clean Energy and Sustainability Group. Thanks for joining us today for a Earth Week lunchtime discussion about the future of New York, uh, the latest in Capolino's series. We're going to be talking today about going beyond local law 97 to decarbonize, improve air quality and health, and improve overall quality of life in New York's low income communities. I'm joined today by my friend, Danelle Baird, founder and CEO of Block Power. Uh, Danelle, I want to just start by saying I know how busy you are during this crazy Earth Week, um, and we really appreciate you taking the time to join us uh, to talk to our audience uh, about everything you're working on and everything you see coming uh, towards us here in New York as we move towards, um, towards a low carbon future. Now, for those of you in the audience, you probably know us already. Capolino is the leading urban strategy firm in New York. We're dedicated to helping all of our clients reach their long-term success through a host of professional services that are focused on strategic planning, lobbying, finance, sustainability, social impact, and real estate. Our firm is also home to New York City's only team that is wholly dedicated to advancing New York's ambitious climate and clean energy agenda. By that, I mean the Clean Energy and Sustainability Group, which I run. We work with startup and early stage companies that are bringing first ever technologies to New York. We work with large global companies that have adopted ambitious clean energy net zero goals and we help them get there. We work with the leading nonprofit organizations that want help with strategic planning and thinking about what's next in the clean energy, sustainable transportation, and, and our environmental future. Um, so today, we're going to be diving into one part of all that, which is decarbonizing New York City's buildings. But we're going to focus on the low-income communities of color that have been hardest hit by COVID and that are, have traditionally not been the first places where clean energy technologies get uh, get put to use. So we're going to talk about how we uh, how we get into that into that world. And we're going to talk about it with Danelle for the next 45 minutes or so we're going to have a conversation. Uh, uh, and we'll go through a lot of different topics. And then at the end, we'll have a, a Q&A period for about 15 minutes. And so please, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. So let's get started. Uh, Danelle, why don't we start by just talking us a, to us a little bit about Block Power, your path to uh, to starting Block Power, your inspiration, and introduce us to you and your fantastic company. Yeah, absolutely, Rich. It's always a delight to get a chance to spend some time with you. Uh, you and I met on a panel a couple of years ago, I think when New York was talking about passing uh, Local Law 97. Now it's real, it's here. Um, so at Block Power, you know, I started Block Power um, about seven years ago um, to focus on analyzing and financing the installation of clean energy, energy efficiency, and now building electrification and decarbonization technologies in low-income buildings. Um, I was a community organizer right after I graduated from college. I was in Brownsville, Brooklyn, which is where Mike Tyson grew up. Also learned is where Eddie Murphy grew up, interestingly enough. Um, so there's a lot of talent there, but there's not a lot of economic opportunity. There's a ton of poverty. Uh, there used to be a juvenile justice center. It still is there. There used to be no high school whatsoever, but there was this juvenile justice, this jail for kids, which gives you a sense of, what kind of bleak future young people have to look forward to in this neighborhood. And Mike Tyson has talked about it extensively, but it's the poorest neighborhood or census tract in New York City, really high unemployment rates, really high rates of HIV, highest rates of domestic violence, just a terrible neighborhood. So I was a community organizer there um, for three years and really got focused on figuring out what it would take to to train and hire the young parents in the neighborhood to be able to get great jobs and have a living wage so that they could take care of their kids and raise their young families. And um, 
I become an environmentalist in college and um, due to one of my best friends talking with me about it. And, and it really was important to me that if we were going to train and hire people to do any job, that it was a job that was, you know, helping the planet become more sustainable instead of the opposite. And so um, after a few years of doing that, joined the Obama campaign, I thought that Hillary would win, but that maybe he could become the vice president. And uh, he obviously won. And then my assignment, because I didn't want to leave my fiance and I didn't want to leave New York to move to DC. My assignment was to work with a coalition of construction unions uh, based out of DC who were focusing on the green buildings and energy efficiency program. Oh, we got a helicopter back here. The energy efficiency and green buildings program during the 2009 Stimulus and Recovery and Reinvestment Act. So my job was to work with these labor unions and and travel city to city and state to state across like 25 states and figure out with governors and mayors and utility companies and investment banks, could we create a green buildings program in each city using the stimulus dollars from 2009? So I did that for a few years. And while a lot of the investments that we made in solar and electric vehicles and batteries and all of that stuff really worked well. A lot of the work and investments that we made in energy efficiency did not work quite as well. And so after doing that for a few years, I decided to go to business school to try and learn about business. Uh, enrolled in Columbia um, and learned enough about business to start a company, Block Power, halfway through B school, focused on analyzing and financing. Um, and installing decarbonization technologies in urban buildings in communities like Brownsville, where I was a community organizer. Most uh, lenders and investors don't want to finance communities like Brownsville. They're viewed as poor, bad FICO scores, low credit, a lot of check cashing agencies. People don't even have bank accounts. Um, but we think there's a massive economic opportunity when it comes to greening buildings and low income communities, in particular, because these buildings waste more fossil fuel energy per square foot than more affluent buildings. So it's the super poor and the super wealthy. It's these two buildings that waste the most energy and waste the most fossil fuels. And so there's a lot of people focusing on the super wealthy, God bless them. We're going to focus on the on the low income and moderate income buildings across America. There's millions and millions of them. And we believe that if we can finance and analyze these buildings and bring them great construction services, that that'll be a massive venture backable market opportunity. So that's that's what we're up to at Block Power. So take us through a typical project. So I I have a building. I'm in Brownsville. I waste a lot of energy. I've got let's say, you know, 24, 30 apartments in the building. I've got an old boiler in the basement. I haven't spent money to maintain the building uh, to upgrade the infrastructure in a long time. And I come to you and I say, hey, Danelle, what can you do for me? Walk me through the process. Walk me through what you do and, 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 and how it's successful. Yeah, so we have you fill out our 10-minute survey online so that all of your information on you and your building is collected and going into our database because we're working with thousands of buildings across New York City. So we, we don't want to lose your information, but we also need some of that data to begin to generate a preliminary recommendation of what a sustainability plan for your building would look like. So once you fill out this 10 second quiz, we query the New York City Department of Buildings database we have a lot of data sources that we aggregate on mortgage histories, property tax histories, 311 calls and violations with HPD, um, plumbing and maintenance records. Sometimes we even look at, you know, whether people vote or not in, in, in local uh, political races. Are you a frequent voter? And we do all kinds of analyses to figure out what kind of sustainability plan makes sense for the type of building that you have, for the age of building that you have. The Department of Buildings may have you listed as having a, a gas system 
but maybe maybe it's actually an oil system so we want to verify that with you they may you know are you pre-war are you post-war are you multifamily with a commercial space on the bottom or do you have a building lobby so there's all of that information and we've built a software system that has uh, tens of thousands of buildings across New York City in it. So once you fill out your survey, our database is able to say, oh, we think, Rich, that you're building, you know, your 50 unit building in Brownsville, you know, you're burning oil, you're pre-war. Basically, we think that you're great candidates for heat pumps in your building and solar because we look at the satellite data of the roof. Um, we think you're probably going to have some lead and asbestos because you're in a low income community. So maybe you haven't spent as much money because you haven't had access to capital to, to remove lead, remove asbestos. Re you may have some mold. So we say, well, we're going to need to come up with a pretty aggressive plan to help you decarbonize this building. And so what we'll do is what you will receive from our database and our software is a five page report that says, look, we think you should upgrade your LED lighting. We think solar makes sense. We want to do heat pumps. And for your building, we're going to, we're going to recommend a, a ductless mini split heat pump, because if you got lead and asbestos, the last thing we need to do is put in a centralized VRF system and deal with all the lead and asbestos in your, in your ventilation system. We want no part of that. So we're just going to add a heat pump layer on top of your building's infrastructure. And Rich, we think we can save you 15% a year on what you're paying for your oil costs right now. So if you're spending 50 grand a year for your oil bill, we're going to put in heat pumps at no cost to you, no money down. And after you pay for the heat pumps over time, over 15 years, and you pay for your new electricity bill, we believe we're going to save you five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a year on your current costs while bringing your building into compliance with all of the New York City and state laws, while saving you money, while making your building more profitable, we're making your building more valuable because now it's a smart green building with cutting edge technology instead of a crusty old oil burning boiler. And uh, this is our plan to bring your building into compliance. And then you would review that five slide plan and you say, you know what, I wanna move forward. Now we're going to sign a 15-year energy services agreement with you. We're going to send out one of our trusted contractor partners who we've got trained and certified by Daycon or Mitsubishi. Um, we're going to send them out and we're going to project manage that project as your owner's rep. And we're going to, we're going to buy the equipment for you. We're going to install it with our contractor. We're going to ensure their work. We're going to provide insurance. We're going to provide warranties to ensure that your system performs as it should over the next 15 years. Every six months, we're gonna visit the system. We're gonna change out the filters for you. We're gonna ensure that that system works. And we're gonna have a constant data stream from the system that we've put into your building. So at any point, if we detect an anomaly that says your system is at risk, of underperforming. It doesn't even have to start underperforming. If we think it's at risk where it might start to underperform, we're gonna send somebody out to check it and take care of it for you. Um, and so we deliver that decarbonization as a service to the building for 15 years while saving that building owner money. So that's how block power works. That's great, that's great. And I'm glad you ended with decarbonization as a service because as you were talking, I was thinking, well, if you don't have the, the, the buzz phrase yet, uh, converting, you know, not software as a service, but decarb as a service, I was going to suggest it. So I'm glad you, you got there. So We're, so, we're aligned. We're, we got the same mind meld going, Rich. That's right. It. That's right. So let's talk about Local Law 97 for a sec. So Local Law 97, for those who don't know, was adopted in 2019 and it'll place carbon caps on most buildings larger than 25,000 square feet across the city. Over time, it's gonna require more than 50,000 residential and commercial buildings to retrofit or otherwise decarbonize the heating and hot water and other energy use that's going on in those buildings. Now, in Local Law 97, as, as it moved towards passage, 
there were a lot of questions about, well, how is this going to play out in low income communities, rent regulated apartments, affordable housing, and so on. And the outcome of that was, hey, let's just exempt the, those buildings, most of them, almost all of them, from the retrofit and, and really firm carbon reduction goals. And we're going to have a different set of requirements that are easier to get to, less, more qualitative, less quantitative. So here we are a year into COVID, a year into understanding just how intense the, the disproportionate impacts on low-income communities of color have been in New York City. And with a real understanding that part of the disproportionate impact comes from poor air quality in these buildings. And now we have a local law, most ambitious in the country, but it doesn't actually require, requires the middle income and upper income buildings to retrofit. It doesn't require the low income affordable housing rent regulated end of the market. So if we wanna decarbonize these buildings too, and we do, and we wanna provide the air quality and human health benefits that come with that, which we do. I know you've talked eloquently about air quality issues in the building that you grew up in. And, you know, um, if we want to do all those things and we want to, you know, frankly, learn some lessons from COVID and the, what we've gone through over the last year, what steps should the city be taking now to ensure that actually happens, that we actually grow solutions like Block Power and, and others to scale so that that piece of the market doesn't get left behind as we move towards local law 97 retrofits and implementation. Rich, you have, do you have children? I have two, 18 and 20. I got, a five, 18. I got a five year old. I know. Um, when my kid, when my kid turns my age, there's going to be climate wars. Half of America is going to be a desert the polar ice caps will have melted. The permafrost will be melting. It's gonna release microbes from the permafrost that cause constant revolving pandemics. This is the future that we're headed to. And you work backwards from that. I have a responsibility to my kid to do everything that I can to prevent that from happening for your children and my children. We gotta ban fossil fuels in all, all buildings, Rich low income, high income, middle income. You're part of the bourgeois, no fossil fuels. You're part of the elite, no fossil fuels. You're part of the lumpen proletariat, no fossil fuels. Now, the private sector has to show up and be a partner here and adopt the Silicon Valley mantra of, we gotta make it better, faster, and cheaper for you to decide as a building owner to decarbonize, right? we have an obligation as the private sector and the city and the state have to do everything that they can to support us, right? As we help to implement this policy, but the policy has to be rich, no fossil fuels. Now, some people might say that's a little radical, but I think telling our kids, you know, when they look us in the eye 10, 15 years from now and say, Rich, Danelle, what did you guys do to prevent massive climate change from happening you and i both are going to look them in the face and say we did everything that we could right the dad did everything that we could and i you know i always talk about my kid when i get these questions because if you work backwards from there the answer is crystal effing clear no we are the wealthiest smartest best educated best resource city in this country one of the wealthiest most influential, best resource cities in the world, we must decarbonize first. There's no reason that we need to be hooking up fossil fuels and building new gas pipelines to buildings, given that the technology now exists. I could understand if, hey, we got to invest a billion dollars to invent some kind of new moonshot technology to to, to, to decarbonize all the buildings in New York City. But the technology is here, Rich. You know that, and so do I. We can order the Daycon heat pumps tomorrow and have them delivered two weeks from now to every single building in New York City. And so we have a moral and ethical obligation 
to deliver on that. So some, from a policy perspective, I think, you know, I, I love Mayor de Blasio. I've, I've been a close ally of his and I support his leadership. I think he hasn't gotten a fair deal because as you said, the green buildings law is the most aggressive green buildings law in the nation. The New York state decarbonization law is one of the most aggressive laws in the country and neither Governor Cuomo nor Mayor de Blasio have gotten the credit for the political courage that they have shown to pass some of the most aggressive climate laws in the world. In New York, we like to criticize our mayor and our governor for every little thing. And a lot of times they do deserve a tremendous amount of criticism. I'm not saying that. But in terms of the conversation that you and I are gonna have with our children 10 years from now, 20 years from now about climate, I don't think our kids are gonna care about the governor did this wrong or the mayor did that wrong, right? They're gonna care that we passed the most aggressive climate legislation in the country, if not the world, and did the private sector show up and support building owners along this path? And I believe that we have financial tools and software tools to deliver decarbonization to all buildings across New York City at scale. The only thing that we're missing right now in my personal view, Rich, and in my business view, is we're missing the workforce that can deliver decarbonization solutions to all of our buildings at scale and at a price point that will be acceptable to building owners. So I don't know if that means we need green job subsidies, whatever, but the policy of the city of New York and the state of New York must be decarbonization, full decarbonization in all buildings. So, so uh, before I ask you about work for, workforce development, which I wanna to get to, I do wanna second what you've said about the mayor's green building law Climate Mobilization Act that it was a part of, as well as the governor's uh, uh, CLCPA, the climate law. Because uh, you know, I have this debate with my friends in California all the time. I think they they're really leading the way on on climate. And I say, hey, you know what? We've got a much tougher environment to, to operate in, and we are adopting city and state legislation that is ahead of the game. That's, that's actually right. defining how big old cities can decarbonize and how big complicated states in northern climates can decarbonize and, and do it in ways that really advance the equity discussion as well. Um, That's right. That's right. So and I'm proud, I'm proud of our policymakers on this climate issue. We, we put them in there, we ask them to lead, and they have led. Now it's up to the rest of us to step up and help to implement their policies. Can they do more to help us implement those policies? Of course, but they have passed policies that are that, that are that are effective and good and useful one of the things that i think about a lot and I'd like your thoughts on is you know we work with a lot of startups that have first ever technologies they're coming up with new ideas they're responding to policy signals that mm -hmm. are saying hey there's going to be a market for decarbonization there's going to be a market for electrification there's going to be a market for for low carbon zero carbon or even carbon negative fuels and we're going to innovate to get to all those different things. It's really exciting stuff. Yeah. Um, do you, but we have a policy architecture, and this is not to, to criticize it. It's to just to note the obvious that, that every law gets frozen in time. It's passed at a moment, with and, and, and we do the best we can to foresee the future, but we can't really see around corners all that well. <laughs> we're, that's just part of being human. And so I'm wondering if you uh, see, as you look at buildings and think about how to decarbonize buildings in the communities you work with, as you say, better, faster, cheaper, more cost-effectively and so on, do you see ways that we can improve the policy architecture to make it more friendly to the kind of innovation we need to really achieve the goals? Because after all, ultimately to really get to scale, to really decarbonize all of the buildings, to get where we wanna go, we're gonna to need to implement the technologies we know of, as well as technologies that don't even exist yet. And so I was wondering your thoughts on whether we're welcoming enough and what steps, if, you're, if, if the next mayor came to you and said, hey, what should I do to make New York even friendlier? 
the new emerging decarbonization technologies. What would you say? I talked to the Yang campaign. They asked, as did Maya <laughs> Wiley, as did Ray, Ray McGuire. So, uh, and, and we're happy. Again, we're, we're here for climate. Um, we're, you know, we, we don't have a dog in the fight. Although I do love Maya Wiley and think she's amazing um, and would make an amazing leader. Um, I, I, look, I, I think that the policy framework, I think we need higher fines. I think we need more certainty. I think that we, again, should include low-income buildings. The question that I have for you, well, I, I think we need to make investments in workforce, and I think we need to make investments in New York City-based manufacturing and assembly and distribution of much of the heat pump equipment that we're going to use. Again, we're the greatest city in the world. We got tens of thousands of buildings to decarbonize just put the damn heat pump factory up in Hunts Point in the Bronx so that we can hire people to make the heat pumps locally at a fair cost and then also train people to install them properly at a fair price across New York City because we're going to be using heat pumps at such a high volume in America, in, in, in New York City. I do think that the, the, the governor and the mayor should be looking at investing in heat pump manufacturing and or assembly and that we need some policy interventions there i also think that there are some policy interventions around data the 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 governments have a vast amount of data decarbonization is really hard i think we need to have an opt-out kind of data privacy framework around energy consumption this idea well it's, uh, it's your building and so your energy you know, your energy consumption is private information. Well, well, damn it, your, your building is putting out pollution into my neighborhood and into my city and is giving my kid asthma. So the privacy of your building's individual data is a fallacy because it is impacting the health of the tens of thousands of New Yorkers that live around your building. Right, right. So, um, and so I think that there's a You're breaking up for a sec. So I'm going to um, maybe use the pause to ask a question, which has to do with uh, Can you hear me okay? So the arm for patient. I can hear you perfectly. Let me. Let me switch to my cell service. Is that better? Yeah, it's good. So, okay, great. Getting the workforce development pieces in place, getting the supply chain and manufacturing in, in place. Um, you know, this is actually a conversation we could have about heat pumps. We could have it about offshore wind. That conversation is going on. It's the same conversation. We could have it about a lot of different clean energy technologies. Um, is this a question about government resources? Is it a question about developing public-private partnerships that leverage private capital? Is it both? Where do we need to go to really move to scale? Because that's the thing that I think is so important. If we're going to really solve this problem and build back New York City better, in a way that hits the environmental goal as well as the jobs and economic development goal. We've got to get to a scale we've never seen before. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, I have thoughts and then I have a question for you. I, I mean, I personally would love to see clearer signals from policymakers around what they believe it's going to take to solve the very hardest challenges. Offshore wind, solar, these are industries that are now relatively mature. They, the, the manufacturing costs, the sales and installation costs have declined. There's, there's now a data set. Wall Street is comfortable financing these technologies. In some ways, the private sector can take it from here with wind and solar. Battery storage, heat pumps, much less mature technologies, particularly in America, particularly in New York City. And so I would want to see more robust and clearer signals around the need to innovate in battery storage and heat pump technologies 
since they both are so central to New York City and New York State's decarbonization plans. And so I do think whether it's a public-private partnership or a joint venture or tax breaks, uh, manufacturing and or assembly of these technologies or research and design. For example, with heat pumps, would love to see uh, carbon capture and utilization of carbon as a refrigerant in heat pumps, as, in, as a heat pump innovation that we as New Yorkers lead the world in. Why shouldn't we research and design and develop that technology here in New York State, right? So I would like to see a slightly, you know, 15, 20, 25% more aggression. But I do think that policymakers in New York City and New York State have done um, a, a, a really good job. I do think that more needs to be done on workforce um, in terms of getting the unions together, locking them in a room with one or two business leaders and saying, we're just gonna throw boxes of pizza in here until you guys emerge with a deal that's going to allow us to to get to scale because i think that that labor force again is the missing element in getting new york city and new york state to scale my question for you rich is i mean you're the you're the policy and legislative guru what was the rationale to the extent that you can talk about it publicly for removing the low income uh, buildings from local law 97 in your view what was the policy rationale or the political I believe it was po politics and I think it was smart politics and I don't disagree with it but in your view how would you characterize that um, from your perspective well um, let me start by saying I wasn't in the room with the boxes of pizza uh, during that <laughs> conversation um, but you know I think we've seen this time and time again right where where uh, concerns are raised about the cost of implementation of a new policy and the response is to exempt those who we believe are least able to pay for those investments as a way to um, make the overall policy more palatable, right? And, um, and that leads historically to a disinvestment in low-income communities of color that, uh, we, that we could point to any issue, right? And we can see a version of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think, that, uh, I think that the thought from where I sit, there was a desire to absolutely make sure that rent regulated affordable housing, low income communities of color saw decarbonization, saw the air quality and health benefits of decarbonization. But when it came to the hard carbon caps and a policy that would absolutely lead to building owners having to spend money, there was a, well, let's, let's figure out a different pathway here. And I think that um, again, it's all about, you know, how well do we see around corners? And as humans, we have limited abilities to see around corners. And where we are today, I think is, you know, you know, I, I think that there's such a growing awareness of the notion that we have to close so many gaps between low-income communities of color and the rest of the city in New York City and every city. And clean energy and decarbonization is one of those, right? Yep. And you're, you know, that's what block power is all about. That's what all your work is all about. That's what your testimony in Congress yesterday was all about. I recommend anybody who's uh, interested and pull it down. Uh, it's real interesting. It's about how do we close that gap? And I think as we think about what's the next step in, in, employ in, 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 um, really integrating local law 97 with where we want to go more broadly on decarbonization and equity. Um, it's thinking about how do we best do that, right? Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think that, um, you know, that's if the next mayor asked me for my opinion, I'd say, well, let's, let's get those people in the room. I don't know if it's pizza or something else, else but let's figure out that piece because, you know, at every level of government, haven't we had the general, um, you know, the general theme is always 
let's start implementing a new approach where we think people are most able to afford it. As a policy yeah. perspective, that may be perfectly fine, but it yeah. has real world impacts that are translatable and quantifiable in terms of excess asthma and other health impacts. And so what we're talking about here, when we're thinking about local on 97, absolutely the most ambitious climate decar building decarbonization law in the country, nothing comes close. And now we think, well, what do we do next? What do we do next is think about how do we scale, deploy at scale in not just in the 50 something thousand buildings that do have to retrofit or otherwise decarbonize, but how do we actually then close the gap for the buildings that are not required to do that? And I do think that that's an interesting conversation. It does involve the private sector. It does involve the new administration and what they're going to be doing on climate and infrastructure and equity. Um, you know, uh, I think DOE is going to have new programs that, that address that directly. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think there's some really fantastic opportunities and, you know, getting back to your, where your question started, workforce development is really central to that because we can't just, I'm, I'm, now I'm, I'm probably saying what you would say, but <laughs> we can't just reduce the emissions to achieve the long-term goals of the city. The future in New York requires us to also address the jobs and economic development opportunities that are embedded in those emission reduction activities. So that's, I, right. That's, that's right. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's right, that's great. It was a long think, answer to your question. I still don't, but I wasn't in the room, so I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 think to your, I think to your point about health, Rich, that, that would be the one area where I think policymakers could do a little bit more is tying the, the decarbonization law to the productive health impact. And if you want to be a brutal MBA pencil pusher and accountant about it, how much money is the state government going to save because we're decarbonizing low income buildings and lowering asthma rates in those buildings, thereby lowering the amount of emergency room visits that occur from tenants in those buildings, thereby lowering the amount of Medicaid dollars that is spent to pay for asthma related emergency room visits and can 20 to 40% of those emergency room Medicaid savings be used as a subsidy to incentivize low income building owners to decarbonize. That kind of relationship between low income buildings, asthma, asthma reduction, Medicaid costs, and Medicaid cost savings as a preventative, right? If decarbonization can also become a preventative medical intervention, I think that opens up all kinds of possibilities for how we think about low income buildings and decarbonization in New York City. There's a health insurance company in the Bronx that reached out to us about this and some folks in Montefiore that were working on this. I'd love to see policymakers explore that a little bit more. So Rich, I think you really nailed it. Yeah. Well, I think that there's, uh, thanks. <laughs> I think that we, you know, we have historically looked at every issue in isolation and, you know, just speaking about climate and, and, and air pollution, those have always been treated as separate silos of policymaking. It, it's, it, it's the way the Clean Air Act was originally written. It's the way it's implemented. It's the way it trickles down to state policy, city policy, and so on. But if we really want to make the case for the broad array of, of opportunity that we want to see in our future New York, we have to tie those together, right? And the externalities of air pollution are real, you know? They're counted in asthma emergencies. That's right. The, the, op, the job and economic development opportunities in deploying at scale heat pumps, carbon capture, all the different emerging technologies are really fantastic. And it's where we're going to go. It's, it, it's where that's we, right. you know, that's, or, you know, one of the, the, the statistics I love, I love is that um, for the five years before the pandemic, 
job growth in the clean energy industry writ large in New York State was two and a half times the state average. For every job across the board that was created in New York 2015 to 2019, two and a half jobs were created in the clean energy sector writ large. And of course, it makes sense. Look what you're doing. You're coming into a building and you're taking out old infrastructure and putting in new infrastructure. Those are jobs. That's not just carbon emissions. Those are actual jobs. And of course, with the pandemic, that job growth stopped. Nobody was going into for a year. Nobody's going into a building to change a, to change a boiler. Well, we were, we were. <laughs> um, <laughs> but looking ahead, this is the way we reindustrialize. This is the way we build uh, economic activity that will continue. You know, every climate policy and energy policy report you look at is talks about where we want to be in 2050. Well, that's 30 years from now. So we're talking about jobs that are created in anticipation of implementing, whether it's local on 97 or, or other energy related policies, it's 30 years of job growth. So um, I think we're really on to something. You, in your testimony yep. yesterday, and this is my last question, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go to the q and in, in your testimony in Congress, because I'm sure I'm one of the few people who read it, who's on this uh, webinar right now. You <laughs> Everybody should read it. No, I'm just kidding. It's terrible. Don't eloquently, it. I thought about the need for community ownership of clean energy and other infrastructure assets. And that's kind of a new idea for a lot of people, I suspect. So I was wondering if you want to expand on that a little bit. Sure. Let me. Let me expand on that a little bit and then bring it back to this first question that you asked about low income buildings being exempt from local law 97 because I think it ties together. So, you know, FDR, when he was president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt built these things called rural electric co ops because the for profit utilities didn't want to lay the electric transmission lines out to rural America. Uh, the cost of putting the electric lines and running them out to all the farms was too expensive in the view of the utility companies, and they didn't want to pay for it. So FDR was, was like, look, we, we have to provide these farmers with electricity. I mean, they have to become part of the modern economy. And so he created this new agency or organization by which the farmers would, would all co-own in a community, all of the farmers would become co-owners of their local rural electric utility. My wife's family has a house up in Delaware County in the Catskill Mountains. And so her family is a member of the rural electric utility company in Delaware County. Like we co-own it and we're members and we're customers who buy our electricity from this utility company where we own shares in the utility company. So my thought is, as we create this new clean energy industry, wind, solar, batteries, heat pumps, carbon capture, as these new industries emerge, how do we use this as an opportunity to respond to historic wealth inequality making sure that we're including historically disenfranchised communities in the clean energy economy, but also from a pure business perspective, if you're a low income building owner in New York and I say, look, we're gonna put in heat pumps in your building. And as part of that, you get a piece of stock in a for-profit heat pump company that owns portions of all the heat pumps and low-income buildings in New York. And anytime Con Edison needs demand response and they need to, you know, turn the heat pumps up, off, or down because of peak demand response and they're going to make payments, or if there's tax credits that we sell off or whatever revenue streams are coming in, because you're a co-owner of this, you know, heat pump co-op that we've created for low-income buildings in New York City, you're going to get a check. That's just a very different kind of conversation than, hey, can I put some heat pumps in your building? We're going to save you money. Yeah, we're going to improve your building to be healthier for your kids. And 
you're going to get some stock in a corporation. Um, and as that corporation becomes more valuable and more important to Con Edison and National Grid and the state of New York and blah, 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 there's going to be potential revenue associated with it, even if it's just all of the carbon credits that are being produced by the heat pumps that we've installed in low-income buildings, and we're going to sell those carbon credits to IBM up in Westchester County, so there's revenue coming in annually from those carbon offsets, and we're going to distribute some of that revenue to building owners who are members of that heat. I just think it's a different kind of interesting way of thinking about this question of how do you incentivize low-income communities to get involved in decarbonization in their buildings? And, and I just think it's a different and better value prop. Of course, it also is a way to raise additional revenue that is necessary to lower upfront costs for low-income building owners as they comply with our very important policy. So um, I... I <laughs> I hammered that home to the Congress yesterday. I don't, you know, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> rural electric co-ops are now, unfortunately, kind of a Republican conservative, you know, group. And so I think some of the Republicans were a little confused that I was using their own, you know, arguments against them. Ownership, they like to talk about ownership. Um, but I, I, I just kind of think that that's an interesting policy opportunity that we all have. And I'd like to see us explored in New York. And we are exploring it. I mean, you know, due to the pandemic, you know, we haven't done as many boiler replacements as we'd like. We've done, you know, 20, a couple dozen or whatever. Um, but we have created a new free Wi-Fi system up in the Bronx that covers several hundred thousand families. And we created a co-op. So they have free internet and we're going to raise the cost to five dollars a month after the pandemic is over for perpetuity and we've created a new corporation where the pastors and priests and rabbis and school principals and nonprofits they all co-own this wi-fi system that we've built and it's their system and we are proud that the biden harris white house uh promoted and included this policy in their infrastructure plan. They said there's $100 billion of broadband capital that they've made available um, to allow low-income communities to co-own Wi-Fi assets. And we want to extend that to clean energy as well and decarbonization. So if I'm, if I'm summarizing it, so at Block Power, you're decarbonizing buildings. You're improving air quality and human health in those buildings. You're reducing uh, energy costs and the total cost of ownership for building owners. You're creating a new ownership structure that will um, provide a, a, some additional income and wealth creation for the buildings and the residents who participate. You're creating jobs in an in a industry that's gonna grow over time you're uh, helping to create uh, a, a new supply chain for the uh, manufacture and distribution of clean energy technologies. I think we've covered quite a bit and it's only uh, lunchtime. <laughs> that's what we're up to. <laughs> but that's, that's what it takes to make all the stuff work in our view. You have to right. align all the stakeholders and incentives and that's what we try to do. So let me go to the, the, the Q&A. Sure. We have a little bit of time left. This has been great. But let me get, go from the, uh, from the high level to the, you know, straight into the details. Kendall Christensen uh, uh, asks, let's talk about pricing and economics. What's the typical per unit installation cost for a 100 unit building for a heat pump installation and conversion? What is this, Jeopardy? I'm not answering that. I'm not telling you. I mean, our <laughs> internal pricing. Kendall, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. I think for like a 10 unit building, you know, we try to get the pricing to around $100,000 all in uh, for equipment purchase and uh, installation labor and a 15 year warranty to guarantee the performance of that equipment, right? So say $100,000 for a 10 unit building or so. Con Edison has some rebates that they'll put in for that. We're gonna finance that $100,000 for that building owner. And depending on whether that building is using oil or gas 
um, whether they have access to solar or community solar, we're going to try to save that building five to 10% of their current oil bill costs. In some instances, we have to incorporate the local law uh, 97 fines, like if you're building above 50,000 square feet and you're, you know, liable um, for that fine, we'll say, well, look, if you don't put in heat pumps, you know, four years from now, you're going to have to pay this fine. Your fine is going to be X amount. So we're going to add that to the cost of operating your building. And so when we put in the heat pumps, we're going to save you, you know, net of all of these other costs. And so, you know, this isn't theoretical. I mean, we're installing heat pumps in buildings in all five boroughs, as well as Westchester and Long Island. And the reason for that is because we're able to do the math and, and show people that we're going to save them money. Now, we can't save money in every single building. Some buildings, you know, Kendall, to your question, if you got a if you got a hundred unit building and it's sandwiched in the middle of a block and we got to hire a crane to get out there and you got a bunch of lead and asbestos in your ventilation system and we can't put the compressors on the roof without a bunch of, you know, sometimes costs can rise. What we're doing is working closely with the city and state. And, and, and frankly, the state has shown a lot of leadership. I'll give an example. We told the state that we would need additional subsidy in order to help churches and synagogues and mosques and the rectories and schools that they own to comply uh, with putting in heat pumps and decarbonizing. Why should these sacred community buildings be left out of the decarbonization revolution? So the state awarded us a small contract. We had to bid for it and write a proposal and whatever, but the Lieutenant governor is coming out tomorrow to launch that contract because it's gonna provide additional subsidy from New York state to certain categories of buildings to ensure that these buildings can decarbonize and do so profitably and be more profitable than they would be if they stayed um, on fossil fuels. And so we think that's the model. Got it, all right. I have four questions here and we have seven minutes to one if we're gonna end on time. Okay, all right. Stay and keep talking uh, as long as other people want to, but uh, we do tend to try to end on time and be respectful okay. of everybody. So let's, I'm going to do a little lightning round here. Let's yep. see if we can answer these questions in a minute or so each. So let's start with, you know, we've mostly talked about your work on heat pumps. Uh, do you anticipate expanding your focus to other, other products, technologies, and so on? Are you going to tackle uh, leaking building envelopes and, and, um, and, and other aspects of uh, decarbonizing buildings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We finance any piece of equipment that's going to decarbonize a building. Heat pumps are the most important in our view and the hardest. So we spend a lot of time talking about it, but we do lighting, solar PV, solar hot water, batteries. Um, we're looking into building facades and what are the things we can do to help people, um, you know, put on a new building facade that, that has an energy efficient envelope. So we are flexible and um, trying to do a broad portfolio of equipment. Great. Okay, so we've talked about job creation and installation, manufacturing, and so on. But you did touch on the the software and data analysis side of block power. What do you yep. think the opportunity is for data scientists, computer programmers, and, and and other STEM workers to create ways to participate in the decarbonization revolution we're talking about? It's essential. We believe that data scientists are critical um, to telling us which piece of equipment should go into which building. So instead of a building paying $50,000 to get a, uh, an uneven or erratic building a energy audit or assessment, we want to use data science. So the cost of getting that recommendation is $0. Um, now you save $50,000 $50, because you're not paying the auditor and you can reinvest that in actually doing decarbonization, which is what we want. So we believe that data science is critical to that and, you know, have a pretty, we've invested, you know, millions of dollars in our data science algorithm in order to help us do that. Okay. A mechanical engineer, HVAC design professional asks, uh -oh. there we go. What, uh -oh. what practical steps uh, can be taken for engineers and entre entrepreneurs to take advantage of local law 97 opportunities in the HVAC area? 
I'm working block power. Send us uh-huh. so send us your resume. If you're a mechanic, if you're engineer interested in heat pumps, we want to work with you. If you want to run your own business, um, I would look into um, you know, for people who can do mechanical drawings, that's really critical. Um, for people who want to actually install heat pumps themselves, you can send us a note. We'll help you get trained with one of our manufacturing partners so that you're certified to become a heat pump tech or installer. Um, that's going to be a really important field moving forward and quite lucrative, we think. So that's what we recommend. Great, great. What's, how can utilities help uh, support your efforts? Uh, more data and more capital. All right. What's the role for the sanitation department in all of this? And, and, and a PS on that question, has Catherine Garcia's ca- campaign reached out to you? <laughs> have not heard of Catherine, have not heard from Catherine Garcia's campaign, but, it, but maybe they did reach out and we missed it, but we will send them a note. We want to advise all of the campaigns on um, how they should be thinking about climate policy. The campaign is a really important moment for New York City. Climate should be front and center instead of people giving Andrew Yang a hard time because he doesn't know what a bodega is. I'm sure there's many New Yorkers who don't know what a bodega is. It's not just Andrew Yang. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I do think that the conversation about climate policy should become more and more robust. These are tough, important questions that have to do with the future of our species and the future of our city. And so um, we certainly want to help all the candidates learn everything they can about decarbonization and what it's going to take. Um, Sanitation department, incredible workforce, a lot of data on all the buildings around New York City um, could be incredibly helpful in terms of helping us, uh, you know, in terms of sharing their data and knowledge of the buildings to figure out how we can get heat pumps. Also, to the extent that all the sanitation workers can go protest the Department of Buildings to improve permitting processes, that would be great also. But we think that doormen, sanitation workers, these are kind of underappreciated. Like 32BJ is a critical workforce partner, right, in terms of decarbonization in buildings. And they have the appetite for it. We think they're an important partner. Same thing with sanitation folks. Um, so putting your equipment in the building um, doesn't require putting a lien on the building. So this is a very specific question. Yeah. Second to last one. So quick answers. Okay. Uh, do you anticipate using uh, that building owners will use uh, commercial paste to wrap your ESA to improve pre- cre- credit quality of the ESA counterparty? Or, or Yeah, perhaps. I mean, there's questions with PACE, particularly in low-income buildings. If you look at the data from California, I mean, lots of cities and states are banning PACE, um, and there's legitimate reasons for that. There's great use cases for PACE, and so some building owners are going to be really interested in it. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just note that we're really interested in seeing how PACE gets implemented here in the city. Been working on that issue for quite a long time, and... Uh-huh. Uh, uh, I think there's going to be a good role for it. Uh, won't work in every building, but certainly will help in some. Last question uh, is, I already know the answer. Do you think we should eventually ban all fossil fuels? No, we should have done it yesterday. <laughs> that's a good end. I think that's a great way to end, end up here. We're coming up on the hour. I want to be respectful of everybody's time and yours. I know we could go on for a long time. And That's uh, right, Rich. I really want to thank you for joining us. I know how busy you are this week. Um, it's just a final rem- reminder to everybody, our next Future of New York panel is scheduled for May 6th. We'll be joined by celebrity chef Tom Colicchio and Andrew Riggi, executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. And the topic will be reviving New York City's restaurant business. Really important yep. topic. I hope you can really join important. the link to register is in the chat. It's on our website. You can go to capolino.com and you'll get, you can sign up for updates. You can, you can sign up for the next panel and you can learn how we can help you achieve inclusive, sustainable business growth in New York. You can answer all your questions. Danelle, I want to thank you so much. Uh, this has been a great conversation. 
Um, you certainly uh, raise topics to keep me thinking for the rest of the day, and I'm sure everybody in the audience, I sure wish we had another hour to keep going. And uh, great. Well, thanks. it's great to be with you. I'm getting my second shot tomorrow. So, Rich, let's get some lunch when That's this all clears great. up. Let's okay. revive the New York restaurant industry. Uh, <laughs> Ourselves. Let's get it started. Is, 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 uh, great to see you, Rich. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.